Welcome to the 21 Convention Podcast. Today we are going to be talking to Don Watkins and Eric Daniels. And this gets into a pretty heady discussion. If you do not know who these guys are, you will not be disappointed by what we discuss because it is a, an absolute explosion of amazing philosophy, mentalities, and new ways to live. If you are a new to the 21 Convention channel, click the subscribe button, get involved with what we're doing, and let's get into this amazing interview. All right, we got Don Watkins, Eric Daniels, the 21 Convention Podcast. What's happening? How you doing? Good, good, good. Good to be here. Yeah. yeah. Hey, let's talk about philosophy. You know, there's so much stuff that we could talk about, but, uh, you know, even with, you know, Ayn Rand philosophy in that direction, educate me, man. What, what's this all about? We hear this all the time at the 21 Convention. We see it as an ongoing theme, but we don't always connect it to all the... Paleo stuff, diet stuff, you know, lifestyle dating. Yeah. You know, where does this play into it? Um, I mean, so Ayn Rand was a 20th century novelist and philosopher. She wrote, I mean, dozens of books and famous books, Atlas Shrugged, The Fountainhead, mm -hmm. a lot of people probably heard of. Right. Uh, and the, I think the connection, it's interesting, the, the 21 convention that I did a couple of years ago about the idea of self, uh, the idea of the self-made man. I mean, Ayn Rand really taps into that American ideal uh, in her novels, in her characters. Uh, a, a number of her characters and even just the idea that she presents of, of, of the whole person is really that you are a being, as she said, of the self-made soul. So it's really that you're not just a self-made man in the material sense, in the physical sense, but all aspects of your being are really about your control, your improvement, what you do for yourself. And so that whole thing kind of ties into all these areas that people want to improve their lives. It's all about taking conscious control and doing that for your life, which she identified what the philosophic roots of that were. Did you want to? Yeah, I mean, so the, if you can think about it this way, she viewed philosophy as, in effect, the ultimate self-help guide. So a lot of, like, self-improvement stuff is scattered. You know, it's a bunch of different ideas. And what philosophy is really doing is right. giving you an integrated view of the world and of human life and how to achieve human potential. And it's doing it with rigor. So it's, it's saying, not just here's some thoughts I had, but we need to be able to prove this is the basic nature of reality. This is how we achieve reliable knowledge. And this is what a moral, successful life looks like. Mm -hmm. And so it's basically allowing you to have a consistent framework rather than just a grab bag of ideas that might clash with one another and not fit together. And, an, and a framework that's true, that's connected to reality so that you can actually achieve your goals and success in reality. You know, this is, uh, this is like such an interesting thing because where she came from and where she was speaking from, I think, is very relevant and uh this is this is gonna kind of have a little bit of a curveball but i you know always loved art i loved cinema i loved theater and one thing that came around with the advent of communism and all that stuff was like this really really good art before they killed them all right but yeah. like but no i mean it was <laughs> yeah. like some of the cinema best plays opposite. like yeah. like all yeah. cinema derives yeah. from like you know eisenstein stuff yeah. and it's just like yeah. Battleship at Temkin, it was like, you know, you know, it, it was like, finally we can speak and have a voice, and then it just spun into the, you yeah. know, this like distorted yeah. thing. But she came from, you know, the, the rejection of those things. And could you guys speak a little bit about the history of how that? Yeah, yeah, she was originally born in Russia in the Tsarist period. So yeah. she was born in uh, 1905 when the Tsar still ruled Russia, and that, and that kind of cultural, yeah. that cultural thing was still there where, where many Russians were looking to the West and they were innovating, they were doing different things. There was a large French influence. I mean, Russia was very tied mm. into to Western ideas. Wow. And then and she you don't, yeah, and you so don't, cool yeah, I mean, and, 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 and you know, the communists wiped that all away. So she grew up and basically as a teenager saw the Bolshevik Revolution. And her family was uh, thrown out of its business. They tried to flee to the Crimea while the Civil War was going on. And ultimately, when the Bolsheviks won, when Lenin won, and the Soviets took over, she basically went back to what was then uh, Leningrad and lived until the 1920s when she basically escaped. I mean, she well, she petitioned to have a visa yeah. to, to leave to go to the United States to visit relatives, which the Soviets allowed, but she knew all along that she would never go back because yeah. she knew she was one of those people that the Soviets couldn't tolerate. Her ideas already, by the time she was in her teens and early 20s, completely rejected the idea of collectivism, rejected the idea of you know this forced state of, of this collectivist ideal, 
And she knew that she was going to get into trouble with that. She was actually, it's interesting that you mentioned it, she was a huge, huge fan of cinema. Mm -hmm. That was actually the ideal that she had. She came to America because she wanted to work in movies. Really? Yeah, and then when she got to America, she first went to Chicago and then eventually made her way out to Hollywood. It's a really interesting story. Really? She, yeah, she made her way out to Hollywood, and get this. She goes and just is trying to find work, doesn't speak great English, and goes to a movie set, and you know, because that's where the movies are made, <laughs> and she's waiting at the gate, and Cecil B. DeMille actually drives off the, wow. the studio lot and sees her, and he's like, hey, you know, you look interesting. Like, you're not the average sort yeah, of American yeah, yeah. woman just sitting there. So he gives her a ride, and she connects up, and then he gives her, like, you know, a, a basic job. I don't know if, Don, if you remember what, what job she gets. She's just, like, a basic job, an extra, things like that. Starts working, ultimately starts, oh, wow, yeah, ultimately crazy, starts working in costume departments, wow. and, then, and then screenwriting, and then, you know, there's a number of movies, actually, now that, that were based on some of her screenplays. Wow. So she basically worked her way up through Hollywood, and then, and then decided to turn her attention to writing novels, and then ultimately, after the novels, into writing philosophy. So. So. The, the, it's crazy because one of the most prolific filmmakers of that time, and I forget her name, was uh, was a female. Yeah, and, and that's yeah. so rare. In, in Ayn Rand, female, you yeah. don't see that yeah. as a as a philosopher, as a yeah. writer, as a as a massive producer yeah. and cultural influence. Yeah. Um, dude, that's that's nuts. I, yeah, man, it's that's, really, that's, yeah, that's she's got, yeah, she's really, cool. yeah, she's got a really interesting biography. I mean, she worked in RKO Studios for a while. Wow. Um, uh, King Vidor uh, was it, he was the producer of the the Fountainhead movie, I think. And so yeah, she had all kinds of Hollywood connections back in the day, and uh, you know, was actually you know so so connected in Hollywood, so to speak, that. She actually was. Uh, she actually testified before the House on American Activities Committee, along with you know Bogart and all these other people, um, that wow. and Ely Weasel and all you know all, the, all these other people that that were involved in Hollywood at the time. So she was really plugged in uh, to the movies. So what about this philosophy that she kind of laid out? That's built a foundation for you guys, because you two guys are, you know, I, I guess rooted, connected, a, a similar philosophy, but expressed in two completely different things. Like, what is the baseline of uh, and I guess you already talked about it, but what is the baseline of her philosophy that came out in your expression of, you know, your book and, and what your work is now? I mean, if you're going to boil it down, it's a complete reverence for the individual and then for what makes individual success possible, which is reason. And those are really the two essentials. It's that you should approach your life through reason, through trying to understand the world logically, which is not an anti-emotion view. She's very pro-emotion because your whole goal is as an individual to achieve your happiness. Mm -hmm. But how do you achieve it? You achieve it by really thinking about what's right and what's good. And so there's a real focus on how the individual can achieve the greatest possible in his life and then how you gear a society towards enabling and freeing the individual to achieve the most of his life. So I focus mainly in my work on politics, on what are the social political right. conditions for the individual to thrive and prosper. But that's all built from having a view of what it means for an individual to thrive and prosper. Most people today basically think, well, it's subjective, and if you're if you're for the individual flourishing, then you're for the individual just doing whatever he wants, right? Yeah. And her view is that no, you you need to re really think about what's good for your life in the same way that you have to think about what's good for your health. So if I came out with a health book that said, all right, Don's hedonist guide to health, smoke, drink <laughs> as much that. as you yeah. want, yes. snort cocaine, yeah. <laughs> everybody would say, Watkins, you're crazy. That's not going to lead to health. But when you ask about the health of a life, which is human happiness, it's well, mm. it's clearly whatever you desire, whatever your own thing is. And her view is there's definitely differences among individuals. You know, I devoted my life to writing and to politics and to speaking, other people to exercise, other people to being architects and so on. But that there's certain fundamental truths of what's good for a human being and that that's what the purpose of morality is. It's to identify those basics. And the most basic thing is a commitment to rationality, which is always going by reason, only going by reason. Hmm. Why is it that you guys think that academia, I mean, maybe now, but he's never picked up on her philosophy. I mean, she's always been a black sheep. I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. never. Well, I, yeah. Uh, I'd say one thing about that. There's a lot to say about it. But one thing is, this has been true historically, that there's always a mainstream in academia or whether it was the church at one time, there's a mainstream body of thought. And when a new kind of thinker comes along, so when mm -hmm. Descartes comes along challenging right. the whole approach, uh, of the Catholic Church before him philosophically, they don't go, hey, those are great ideas. You get a complete resistance because what you have is an innovator saying, you don't have a couple wrong conclusions, yeah. your whole approach is wrong. So Ayn Rand is saying the whole way you guys are doing philosophy or think you're doing philosophy is wrong. 
So it would be ridiculous to make, to think that they were going to go, okay, that sounds cool. Yeah. I think there's a, that's one fundamental reason why. She's saying your whole way of thinking about philosophy and all the conclusions you've come to are wrong. Yeah, and, and I mean, another another big thing, I mean, I worked in universities for, you know, yeah, a yeah. dozen years. The other, the, other, the other unfortunate thing about the universities, and this is true more, I think, in the humanities fields and the kinds of fields that she would have been appealing to, philosophy, history, political theory, those kinds of things. Uh, but it's true, I mean, and unfortunately, as we see with some of the ideas about medicine and health and other things, it's true really across the board. Unfortunately, the universities, in a way, are designed and set up as as turf protection organizations. People have their turf, they want to protect it. And so yes. when someone comes in, like yeah, Don says, time. to challenge something, they, they're threatened, their position is threatened. And the, and the problem with it is, is this is in complete contrast to private businesses. Yeah. Right? Private business, somebody comes in with an innovative idea, you don't like it, they say, fine, I'll start my own business, I'm gonna innovate, I'm gonna do it, and I'm gonna out-succeed you, and I'm gonna displace yeah. you in the market. The universities largely, now of course there are private universities, but because of the massive government influence in terms of funding research, funding uh, scholarships. Publish your pairs, man. Yeah, publish your pairs. All that stuff is basically tightly controlled, and if you lose that, that's high stakes for them. But there's no profit motive for them. There's no, yeah. there's no underlying thing that says, you've gotta be better and watch the innovations and improve, in order to survive, otherwise you're dead. And, and that just doesn't yeah. happen in the universities. And I think the bummer about universities, and of course there's like great stuff about it, but the, is that the, the running from the capitalism, you know, that, that, that she is, you know, attached to. And, you know, and here's what's interesting, is she wrote books, so she had a creative expression, and most philosophers, or a lot of philosophers did, yeah. uh, you know, to prom promote their, or, you know, to, to put into application of their philosophy. But very, very different, you know, very different. You know, Atlas Shrugged, The Fountainhead, very different than, uh, you know, like, let's say Thomas Pinch's The Postmodern Guys right. or, or whatever Jacques Derrida was doing. And, uh, you know, it, it, she just had a very, very different angle. Um, what is it that you think, like, kept her in the dark? Because... Hmm. I, you know, you see the capitalism side, but she was, if you, okay, if you read those books, that's one thing, but if you read her actual philosophy, yeah. it's, it, it's much different. Yeah. You know, it's not necessarily promoting one way to do something, it's right. actually the ideology, the, the, the root, the, the general underlying foundation, yeah. foundational yeah. philosophy behind it. What do you think stopped her? Um, I mean, in part, you know, the, the, the thing, I mean, the publication of those two books, her first novels, right, her publication of her novels um, were, Basically, they're coming at a time in American culture when left-leaning ideologies, you know, non-anti-capitalist ideologies, are basically at their height. Right in the 1930s through the 19, say 50s, 60s. The 60s, there's a whole revolution. You know, all kinds of ideas are yeah. upturned and new things are coming out. But she's writing in that middle period during the Roosevelt years, during the years when Americans basically had had collectively said we've given up on these ideas. And she comes along and says, no, no, no. Essentially. I've seen these ideas real double down, full stop in Russia. You know, I know what it really right. looks like. Yeah. You guys are just flirting with it. Yeah. You think you know what it's about. So she comes along and, and very strongly, as you said, very strongly goes completely to the opposite pole in a sense and says, you guys are, as Don says, you're, you have, you're not just wrong in, a, in application, you're wrong in fundamental approach. You're wrong in the way you think about things. You have to start completely from the ground up. And so that's one of those things that when, when a thinker is that radical, and, right. and not doesn't just challenge. I mean, you know, you look at something like the and aggressive. Yeah, and you yeah. look at something like the Protestant Reformation. You know, Luther comes along, criticizes the church. Calvin criticizes the church, and the Catholic Church has to respond. But they're all still Christians, right? They're all still working within the framework of you know ultimate salvation, Jesus as the leader of the church, et cetera, et cetera. They have a lot of differences about how the church is structured, whether you should read the Bible in Latin or in the vernacular, all these kind of particulars. And so it's, and, and you think the Protestant Reformation fundamentally changed the map of Europe. Wars, hundreds of millions dead because of this, all of those things, but that's not nearly as radical as what Ayn Rand is doing. Ayn Rand is going along and saying, it's not just your particulars. It's you have to go back to the the very fundamentals of philosophy, which is the which mm. is the most fundamental, you know, in a sense, ideas yeah. about all ideas. And that alone, I think, when you have that kind of philosophic change, is inevitably going to be polarizing. It's inevitably going to be she's going to make herself an outsider because it's it's not even the same language for them. You know, it's it's not, you know, Calvin comes along, Luther comes along, they at least speak the same language. They have the same framework. They're like, oh no, you shouldn't do the liturgy this yeah, way, yeah, you shouldn't yeah. do it that way. They're she's saying, she's saying, other, I don't yeah. care what you're doing, you're wrong from the beginning, you've got to start over. Yeah. Well, I mean, immediately people are gonna be hostile to that, even if they tend to be otherwise sympathetic about certain of her ideas. 
They're just going to be hostile because fundamentally reconsidering your basic ideas is something that's very, very difficult to do. <laughs> yeah, so take terrifying. One, take yeah. one example. But before you get yeah, started, yeah. let's pause for one second. All right. We got to take a quick break and we'll be right, right. back with what Don's got to say. All right, we're back. Don Watkins, what were you about to say? So Eric mentioned that she's challenging things from the ground up. And yeah. take a core example of it. You have people who are willing to challenge conventional wisdom on all sorts of issues, on scientific issues and religious issues. She's one of the few in history moral revolutionaries. She's saying that our whole way of thinking about what's right and wrong is mm. wrong. And so take the issue, one of the issues she's most famous for, which is she's pro-selfishness. She thinks that an individual right. should be committed consistently to achieving what's best for his life, neither sacrificing himself to other people nor others to themselves. Now, what have we been taught as the like, least controversial idea on earth? It's that selfishness yeah, yeah, yeah. is bad. Yeah, yeah. And now she thinks if you really understand what it means to be devoted to your own happiness, if you really have an understanding of what that looks like, then it's actually the most noble thing that a person can do. But partly what she's challenging is the idea that being devoted to your self-interest, that being selfish means, as we talked about, doing whatever you feel like, being like a Bernie Madoff or being like a playboy. Her view is that, no, it's something much harder. It's being much closer, at least in his productive career, of a Steve Jobs, somebody committed to creating values, to being rational in pursuit of the best life possible. And that is something so different. So, I mean, if you think about who her heroes are, her moral heroes, the people she holds up as exemplars. So, on one hand, it's people like fa the Founding Fathers, but it's also people like Isaac Newton, and then it's also people like Steve Jobs or like uh, Andrew Carnegie, people who are great productive exemplars in every sort of field. And the idea that that's what morality could be sanctioning and holding up as the, what we should be striving for, rather than say, hanging out in a soup kitchen and doing your duty and serving God or serving society. Mm. That is something that virtually no other thinker in history has ever held. And so, I mean, you're really talking about somebody who's tapping into one of the most deep-rooted views that human beings hold, which is right and wrong, and saying the way you're thinking about it is totally wrong. Yeah. Man, this total side note, but Isaac Newton was, was insane. He was, you know that he yeah. created the Principia Mathematician in Split Light in one year, and then the rest was kind of like this, yeah. like, yeah. like, good year. Yeah, 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 totally, yeah. totally, totally like, yeah. While, he, while he's on his, like, on the farm, sitting out all alone, because he's waiting out the, the, I think there was a plague, a, a or pla plague. no, it wasn't plague, it was uh, maybe a, a, a rapture, some sort of, some sort of, uh, yeah, disease, and he's just, like, sitting by himself, thinking through these things, yeah, it's amazing, no, it's amazing just, thinker. It's just nuts, and the yeah. sad thing is, is all those guys, like, John Locke and, 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 uh, and Edmund Haley were, like, Trying to do alchemy and yeah, drinking yeah, their own yeah. They're still coming on the end of that. Yeah, they're <laughs> still coming on the end of that kind of uh, pre-modern mind. But yeah. but man, and all those guys, amazing stuff. And uh, actually, some more productive than Newton. But that one or those two things were just freaking nuts. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah just, the optics and the yeah, yeah. yeah. But this is so. Just to go back to something I said before, yeah. this is what it looks like to have a commitment to reason and what that makes possible. So Newton's commitment to really thinking yeah, through the nature totally. of the universe made possible our traveling to the moon among a million other achievements. Yeah. And that, like, that's her view of, that's what, un what reason unlocks. It's in effect a flashlight that helps you guide your way around reality and ultimately a giant spotlight. You know, it's so, this is odd, and this goes into your speech of uh, somebody asked you a question about conspiracy stuff because Newton also tied to like the Invisible College and, and Haley and all these guys were, you know, thinking about all this stuff when that, this wasn't the case. They were guys that had a love of science and exploration and turned it into a level of reason, you know, of, of thinking these things through and how can this, these insane philosophies, you know, be put into an application of, uh, you know, building scuba gear to, you know, the comet to calculus and all this sort of stuff. But, you know, where, where do you see that happening in this culture now with, you know, minds unifying and connecting because people that were fans of, Ayn Rand's work came from the outside. They're not of the norm. Yeah. They're not of the mainstream. You know, she like selfishness. Um, you know, aligned with kind of like hokey philosophy and all that sort of stuff. So where are the, you know, where are the real minds of change happening in today's culture? 
Well, I mean, I think the the easiest place to see it is a place like Silicon Valley, where you have people devoted to making something great and making something new and challenging the way things are done. I think you see it in other places, but that's certainly, I think, the most obvious example of that sort of attitude and approach towards life. And notice it's also one of the most free parts of the economy, mm -hmm. one of the least controlled by government. And that's not an accident uh, in my view, and I don't think it would have been in her view. Yeah, and I, and I think one of the other areas uh, today, I mean, part of it is an interesting question in that in that the kinds of innovations, the kinds of things that are going to break through like that, we don't we don't necessarily see. But if you look past, like I mean, the, the the sort of internet revolution, one of the really really interesting things about that is, to me, as you said, yeah, some of these people are kind of coming from the outside. They're not within the mainstream because. Well, they're probably bucking the trend. I mean, they're they're coming along and they're doing something different. What's really really interesting about that space in the economy that it, it is free. It's very very innovative. It's very very fast paced. What that means is, in a way, the 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 funnel of talent is actually getting much much bigger. Right before the funnel of talent was was controlled by the elite universities, the the top, right. you know the fortune the top fortune companies. It was it was a very clear hierarchy, a path of if you want to be successful. Here are the you know twenty different things that are available to you. Now, if you want to be successful, there's an entire world out there for you to do it. And the means, I mean, basically the guys who who took the internet, which was a government project that really had no economic value, and massively translated it into something that people could actually use. I mean, you know, you think back to when people said, "Oh, you know, what you're going to be able to buy and sell stuff." Like, what's this internet thing? You know, when it first came out, <laughs> people thought, people thought, We're now going yeah, invented. yeah, yeah, when Al Gore invented it, right? <laughs> and people thought, you know, what what's the useful of this, like, you know, I mean, I get email sure. and whatnot, but what's the useful? And people couldn't, I mean, in in the mid '90s, people couldn't even imagine the kinds of value that have been created by basically these tools. Not just the infrastructure itself, but the actual ways of communicating. You know, Twitter, Facebook, any of these things. The the idea of big data that Google kind of innovated. You know, just take take tons of data and find great computer algorithms to go search right. through it and find information that people are applying to all kinds of other things. All this kind of stuff, that innovation, that that funnel, as it were, the talent pool can come up from a much much broader area. You know, you get 15-year-old kids writing apps and making millions of dollars. You get people coming out of, you know, people coming out of areas that you don't expect and saying, "Hey, I've got a better way of doing this. Is there a way that you know that I can get it to people?" Before they couldn't get it to people because you know a big uh, R&D specialist at some yeah, firm yeah. wasn't going to do it. But now there's a lot more venture capital. There's a lot more. There's really just a lot more dynamism in in the creative side of the economy. Where I think that's where you're going to see the talent coming from, and that's where you're going to see people who say, "I'm going to live my life. I'm going to do the things I want to do. I'm going to I'm going to live for myself and be the best person I can be and be productive and be happy. And here's where I can do it." You know, yeah. notice, and it, it, and notice it applies also in the realm of ideas. So before mm -hmm. you had a bunch of gatekeepers, yeah. if you had, to, you had to get this major publisher to think, yeah, your book will sell or something. And so you know, at this conference, for instance, you had people coming at a high intensity exercise, for example. You'd have to to get those ideas out there. You basically have to find a major publisher willing to you know give Big you time. a deal. Big time. But yeah. where's the market for it? I mean, it, the the fact is everybody can get ideas out there now, and the challenge is you just have to make your ideas much more appealing and work a lot harder to build an audience rather than find your way through a handful of gatekeepers the way that you did say 30 Man, years I'll ago. Man, I'll tell you this, like just even having this conversation because it's so stimulating and like you know, it's really a cool thing. It reminds me of when I was a kid, you know, I was growing up in Orange County and, and uh, listening to NPR and thinking that that was you know, the, yeah. like, but it was so stimulating. It was yeah. like, man, there's like all these great interviews, but I didn't realize how filtered yeah. that was, yeah. Yeah. you know, and how yeah. like one-sided. And then moving around and traveling, you're like, whoa, the world is saying a completely yeah. different yeah. thing. I remember yeah. I interviewed these guys, and uh, oh, it was such a horrible, horrible thing to say. Um, but I was talking to these homeless guys. I was talking to them about American culture, and I said, oh, well, do you have all this hope because you know you're homeless? And the guy was just like. Man, he he actually said to me, he's like, man, fuck you. He's <laughs> like, do you realize what you're saying? Did you yeah. realize what yeah. that means? And he, yeah. and he just broke it down. He's like, dude, I have religion. I have these things because that's what I believe in. Yeah. You know, for you who thinks, he just, man, he like totally took me to yeah. school. Yeah. But, but I mean, like, that's the, I mean, that's the thing. Like, you listen to one radio station now, you know, you've got, I mean, this, you know, the yeah. one convention. I mean, just <laughs> the space in which people can, can create and innovate in intellectual areas, I mean, whether it's book publishing or podcasts or, I mean, I don't know, hundreds of different ways yeah. that people are communicating ideas. That that's 
I mean, to me, that is, that's opened up a space. And it's still, you know, it's still sorting itself out. I mean, people are still figuring out. Right now, I think the big change that I see is uh, now that content creation is, is basically limitless. I mean, people, people now have very, very low cost, if cost at all, right. for content creation. Uh, the, the big question is, uh, who's going to come in and innovate in a way that actually sort of stabilizes that and, senses, and, and yes. makes it such that people can search yeah. it, can get what they want, right. the, you know, sort of content is out Be there. Be the I Google mean, of information. You know, yeah, Darden right. yesterday was talking about how many e-books are published every day. But, but how do you search those? How do you, you know, yeah. Amazon hasn't yet figured it out, Google hasn't figured it out, but people are working on that problem. I know that. Right. I mean, I don't know the people, I don't know what company they're with, and maybe some kid in a dorm room, I don't know. But somebody's going to figure out how do I actually target this information, get it to the people that want it, yeah. figure out a way of actually, in a, in a sense, it's what happens in markets a lot. How do, how do you rationalize the market in a way that, that actually takes this sort of bubbling up of, in this case, information, and actually gets it to the people that want it? Same thing happened in, let's say, the oil industry in the late 19th century. You know, Rockefeller was a great integrator of all these different production systems, all these different distribution systems, and he said, look, oil is an enormously valuable product. Everybody's going to want it if they could just get it. But there's a, like a thousand producers, a thousand refiners. They're, they're scattered all over Ohio and Pennsylvania. Yeah. How do I actually figure out the ways of making this system work? And he comes along and he figures out the innovations and his engineers figure out the innovations. And suddenly he's, he's basically giving oil throughout the world. I mean, shipping it all over the world. Hmm. You know, in the space of about 10, 15, 20 years, he's come along from like what is basically just a, a kind of random market to transforming the whole energy industry. And that same thing is happening now. I don't think it's happened yet because I still see a lot of churn in that kind of marketplace. You know, our sort of uh, pu published on demand or eBooks or like what's actually going to sort out as the way to get content out there. Right. But it's so the pipeline is it's so much bigger. A lot. It's yeah. so much bigger than what you know than what you had publishers doing you know 20 years ago, yeah. where you know each house would come out with maybe 100 books a year. I mean, now it's like 100 books an hour, uh, you know, or whatever it is. I mean, it's probably even more than that, you know, just the, the kind of content creation stuff. And you think about all those lost opportunities. I mean, that's what I always think about. It's, it's the things that you don't see, right? I mean, a great example of this, I always think about uh, when people talk about the productivity uh, of an economy. And if the economy is, is regulated, controlled, or I mean, even take the 19th century, you know, south, right? Slave labor. You know, slave labor adds certain input to the economy, but you think about all of the ideas, all of the kinds of creativity that, that slaves could have come up with, but that was prohibited to them by law. Mm -hmm. You think today, the, the gatekeepers, right, you know, which some are enforced by law, some are just you know, informal institutions, but all of the stuff, all of the novels that were written that just sat on somebody's bookshelf because nobody wanted to publish it. Well, all, Ayn Rand's the founder. Yeah, was uh, yeah, rejected, rejected by, by like 12, 12 publishers. publishers. Yeah. Yeah, That's you just, it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you just, you just think about all of, the, all of the people who, I mean, and whether it's somebody like Stephanie Meyer or you know, Twilight Books or, or something else. I mean, look, great hey, books. Yeah, great, great, yeah, yeah great no doubt. I mean, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, but, but obviously tapping into something that was incredibly desired by 13-year-old yeah. you know, girls, I guess. But the idea is that in 20 years ago, that would have never worked for her. Right? I mean, she's now right. a multimillionaire, yeah. you know, yeah. a movie franchise, mm -hmm. a whole book, you know, a whole book series. All of that stuff's possible because she was able to take something that otherwise would have just sat on her shelf and say to somebody, you know, like, hey, do you think this works? And now it's not that it, not that really, really tight gatekeepers. It's now people who are willing to take risks. So is it the, the marketplace that simulates this or is the marketplace a metaphor for how humans interact? I don't like the word. Uh, I think it captures something right, but it, it, right. it makes it hmm. too, yeah. it really does make it too much like this mechanical thing. Uh, what, what a market is, properly speaking, is individuals interacting voluntarily hmm. under a rule of law, protection of rights, protection of property yeah. rights and contracts especially. And so the right way to think about it is are, these are vo what happens when people are free to interact voluntarily such that you and I are only going to deal with each other when we both win. And part of what emerges from this is that we both have an incentive to create things that other people are going to find valuable so that we can get a lot of these win-win relationships, make a lot of money, achieve a lot of our values. And so one of the things I always point out, uh, you know, there's such an anti-business view and anti-business bias, right. particularly big business bias. Um, but we live in a world where right now there's people thinking about how to make your life more entertaining, how to make better music yeah, yeah, for yeah, you, yeah. how to send you in the coolest theme park rides, show you the coolest shows, keep you alive longer and healthier and more enjoyable. They're sitting around thinking about how to do that for you. Why? So that they can get all the things that they want, so they can reap immense profits. That's what a market is, and that's amazing.
Yeah. yeah, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm with Don. I, you know, the marketplace metaphor, you know, grows out of it. Actually, historically, grows out of a time when regulatorily, you know, the English or the French monarchy said you can only bring your goods and sell them to other citizens on these days in these locations. There was no private transactions. There was, it was literally a physical marketplace that there were market towns and people who had, you know, it was largely agricultural products because two, three, four hundred years ago. But basically, they were only allowed to sell at certain prices, under certain conditions, et cetera. And that's what a marketplace was. Now, people use it as a metaphor, the marketplace of ideas, the, you know, the marketplace. But what it really is, like what Don said, it's, it's basically the perspective. If you think about what's driving these changes, it's a perspective that uh, it, it, over, despite a lot of bad things, over the course of the last 50 years, there is a way in which private transactions and private innovation have actually been opened up, partly by technology, yeah. partly by ideas. Mm. You know, th now, and I mean, you know, I hate to I hate to have to say that Ronald Reagan was right about one thing or another, but there was one thing, you know, if it if it moves, tax it. If it doesn't, you know, I forget how, how does he say that? It's, you know, if basically, it moves, regulated. if it moves, regulated, you know, if it makes money, tax it, you know, and yeah. basically you just, the government's going to find a way. So what's actually happening is that there's a, a kind of uh, cat and mouse game where the areas of innovation are constantly pushing outside of those regulatory bounds. As they're doing so, they're creating enormous value. And, and in some ways making the case themselves that the regulations aren't working. So they want to, to sort of forestall that and keep that away. But basically all of these private transactions, all of these people acting individually and their ability to do so under a stable rule of law system, which is you know, try doing this in the Middle East, try doing this in Africa, try doing this in a place that's unstable. Why are you gonna spend the time? Why are you gonna invest hundreds of hours of your own time uncompensated on the idea that you might be able to produce a product that somebody's gonna wanna buy? In the United States, you've got that freedom, you've got that ability because you know, hey, if I get the actual great product out there, people are gonna buy it, right? Out there, you say, well, you know, the government might just ban it. The government might tell me, they might throw me in jail. They might tell me that I'm destabilizing the regime. They might do any kind of number of things. In the United States, with the rule of law, with respect for property rights, with respect for contract, you can do those things. Now, you have to succeed on your own merits. Right? You have to be an innovator. You can't just try to do this and hope that somebody buys it. Yeah. You actually have to come up with innovative stuff, but you hold the promise that if you do, the other side of that equation is that there's people like you, me, others that are going to buy that stuff. Yeah. You know? Man, we got to, uh, we're, we're out of time in like one sentence, maybe three. <laughs> what gives you hope? What gives you hope for you know, humanity, America, what's going on? What? I think this discussion sums it up. As much problem as we have today, we still have the freedom to get our ideas out there. We have a better way to get our ideas out there. And I think that it's good ideas that are really the key to winning the future. And we, we have the potential to unleash them. The wow. goal is to make them as persuasive as possible and as compelling as possible so that we win that battle of ideas. Great. Yeah, and I mean, and the, thing, the thing for me, the, the, the content is open, the, the pipeline is open. There's a lot more ideas out there. What's most encouraging to me is actually the larger percentage of people that I that I meet, that I encounter, that are willing to take the responsibility, sort of self-responsibility, mm. to figure the things out. I know the information's out there. Like Don says, like, I know that the good ideas are out there. They just have to get to people. And part of that is the delivery, but part of it is also, I meet a lot more people, I think, I mean, maybe I've got a sample bias, but uh, a, a, bias, you know, a bias sample, but I think there are more people who are willing to say, I'll figure this out for myself. I'm not going to trust, you know, some government, somebody to tell me these things. Cool. If they do that, the ideas are out there and they're going to find them. Great stuff. Yeah. Eric Daniels, Don Watkins. Awesome. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Thank you guys so much for watching. I love doing these interviews. I love doing these podcasts. And if you could, keep this message going. If you're on social media, pass it on. And of course, subscribe to us on our YouTube page so you could get updated on all the cool stuff that we are doing here. I'm Steve Maeda, signing off. Let's stay in touch.